The hardest part of this process is separating the wheat from the chaff because there are plenty of repeated designs, plenty of watches that just have different dial configurations. So of the 40 watches I've chosen for this video, yes, 40, I've tried to go for ones that have fairly new or updated designs or a different configuration, not necessarily a different dial color. It's been an interesting year, not the most exciting year for releases by far, but there have also been some great ones dotted around at different price points. So design, new configurations, let's get into it. One of the earliest releases of the year was the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Act 1. Of course, there were two others that came after this watch, but I think this was the most impactful. Great size, awesome colorway. Of course, it's a limited edition, so can't exactly get our hands on it, but a very nicely balanced piece that pulled a lot of inspiration from early Aqualungs. It's just so unfortunate that we can't get watches of this kind of size, this kind of quality, given to us en masse by the brand. The Tag Heuer Carrera Chronograph 60th Anniversary Edition Panda. Now that's a mouthful. A beautiful recreation of one of the earliest Carrera chronographs, the reference 2447SN. A great understanding of its size, its proportions, its balance overall, but we will get into that further as we discuss these pieces. The Volcane Nautique. Now we know Volcane for the crickets and all of that history, but this skin diver is beautifully executed. Orienting itself around the 1960s as a very faithful callback, there was a great touch of balance on this dial. The accentuated minute marks, full hash bezel, the length of the hands and how they work on the plots of this dial. If you haven't been keeping up with Volcane and their revival, well worth looking into, and this watch is just one great example. The Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore Beast in all black ceramic. This calling back to a near 30 year old design of the original AP Offshore. This was a very important watch for the future of the brand, created by a young designer. And we must remember that at this time, the Royal Oak was seen as quite an old man's watch at this stage, quite uptight in its design. This Offshore was important because it reintroduced the Royal Oak design to a younger audience. And well, the results speak for itself. A great recreation and tribute. Now we're looking into a watch that is not a tribute, can you believe? The Zin T50. Just an all-round brilliant new addition to their dive watch collection. An excellent size, borrowing elements from the UX, the U50, the U1, giving it to us in a tegumented titanium case, and some examples even come with a gold bronze bezel. This T50 doesn't just scream proficiency from a German design point of view, but overall, it's just such a well-balanced watch, and I think one of the best go-to divers of the year. The Patek Philippe Calatrava 6007G. Something that appears a lot more accessible in its design because of its bright spot colors, and I think they really nailed it. It goes to show that it's quite easy to turn a formal design into something a lot more approachable. Whether or not the enthusiasts or the connoisseurs will appreciate it is another point entirely. But a great looking watch. Use of texture, contrast, a bit more of a youthful approach. The Alunga and Zona Odysseus Chronograph, an ambitious design that now looks even better. Taking a new movement, new caliber, new case design, doubling down and creating an even more complicated watch is kind of what Alunga and Zona is known for. And here we see a piece that celebrates the uniqueness of the Odysseus design but manages to somehow increase that feel of a sports instrument, very much like the Calatrava we've just looked at. An all-round stunning design, dare say one of the best looking sports chronographs of the year. The Nevada Grenchen F77, with all the brands going towards the integrated bracelet craze, Nevada Grenchen also jumping onto this train, but this is a very well put together watch, and I think its design speaks for itself. It has the many recognizable elements that we find with all of these collections, but what it also does manage to do is pay attention to those smaller details. The watch having an accessible size, a great bracelet. So many applied elements on its dial and balance across the board. Next to that is the all new IWC Ingenieur, 40 millimeters, another great wearing size, but a watch that's also been quite controversial with its pricing structure and the movement that's on offer. Design wise, it's trying to borrow elements from the old and the new and whether or not it gets it all right is purely subjective. But it's another integrated sports watch now in this massive collection. I think if this watch had launched five years ago, would have made an even greater impact. The Cartier Tank Normal. Now Cartier has been on a winning streak this year with their releases, the American, so many great models, but the Normal really caught a lot of attention because of its new bracelet integration, great new size, mostly precious metals, limited editions for sure, but the design is just beautiful. It is so nicely put together and it's a great callback to the model from the 1920s. And funny enough, it feels like a piece it seems to be pursuing the integrated bracelet trend one way or another. But I think in all of its originality, Cartier does it better. 
The Zenith Pilot Flyback, a piece that didn't get a lot of attention this year, but I think deserves it. Especially considering the Pilot Collection and how it has looked for a very long time, this feels like a fresh new face to the collection. An entirely reworked caliber, a large date on the dial, how nicely all of these components synchronize together. Unfortunately, Zenith is predominantly recognized today by the El Primero and the Defy. The Pilot has a lot of work to do. But nonetheless, a great looking design, a subtle tribute to the Rainbow and the older pilot pieces from the 90s and early 2000s. The Grand Seiko Tentograph, their first automatic chronograph. It's a big deal for the brand. Whether or not its design is anything significant or impactful is another question. It's using all sorts of new technology that comes very close to Omega's coaxial tech, but also has great specifications to match and it falls very neatly into the new Evolution 9 collection. On to Rolex, many new watches in their collection, but the 1908 was one that raised a lot of eyebrows, let's put it that way. The discontinuation of the Cellini and a design of a watch that now pays close tribute to one of the earliest Oyster Perpetuals. And the 1908, I believe, signifies the first year that Rolex was used as a name, as a trademark. Whether or not this watch has a future is anyone's guess, but it does incorporate a lot of new features. A neat deployant clasp, a clear case back, it does feel like Rolex is playing catch up in this game and pursuing brands at a different hierarchy. Nevertheless, an interesting looking piece. Two other great new additions the GMT offered in two-tone as well as solid gold. This was a long time in the making and this configuration, especially on the Jubilee bracelets, really gives us that 1970s, 1980s feel. Something that I think a lot of us can appreciate. The Rolex Explorer was given to us in a 40mm size from 39 to 36 to 40 Seems like it's going all over the place, but a great watch for those who can't rock the 36. Of course, we can't forget the Rolex Daytona 126500LN, an excellent upgrade of the previous generation. So many minor tweaks and adjustments to this watch that not only make the watch look bigger on the wrist, but also call back to not only early four digit references, but also the El Primero references. This piece in a lot of ways feels like Rolex's greatest hits album, of the Daytona family. And next to that, arguably another one of the best chronographs released this year, the tribute to Le Mans. What makes this watch look even more special is it feels even closer related to the four digit reference numbers, with a very on the nose callback to the Paul Newman Daytona with those subdials. And it is excellent seeing Rolex go down this route, paying closer attention to those vintage details and aspects, fusing them with modern watches, but not hitting you over the head with the design changes. I think this indicates to us that Rolex has quite a future ahead of them if this is the design direction they plan on taking. All power to them. Tudor, on the other hand, spent a lot of time giving the Black Bays a facelift. The Black Bay 41 now with Meta certification, burgundy bezel, callback to the original from 10 years ago. Now with two lines of text on the dial, master chronometer, and of course, a five link bracelet that they like to call it. Next to that, the Black Bear 54 feels like a culmination as a design, one that they have been working towards for a very long time. Now they fully understand the case profile, how these watches wear on the wrist, and what it can do as being a subtle nod to some of the earliest Tudor Submariners in their range. A great attention to detail with these pieces and ones that are even better to wear. The Tag Heuer Carrera glass box. Now this one was a surprise, sort of a showstopper at Watches and Wonders. The reasons are quite obvious, a good understanding of its size, the internal bezel being the most interesting part, where the tachymeter and the minute scale are three-dimensional and fully integrated. But more importantly, the models that it's paying tribute to, with a date at the 12 o'clock position, and further expanding on this collection with the skipper, this piece paying tribute to their famous yachting chronograph. There were many other pieces in this range released this year, but all of these watches understand many of the fundamentals. This is Tag Heuer representing a historic design, but doing it tastefully. Not in your face, obviously throughout the design process, also showing you their forward thinking with how the watch looks. And the end result is a range of pieces that speak for themselves. A great new direction for Tag Heuer. And I'm sure a lot more people have eyes on the brand because of it. The Jojo Le Couture Reverso Tribute Skeleton Chronograph. One of, if not the best, released chronograph of this year. Why it is so successful as a design is because it embodies JLC's approach. It is extremely subtle. And on the face of it, yes, that's a terrible pun, you wouldn't even notice that this watch houses an incredible chronograph at the back. Very much like how the best duo face reversos work, it's a night and day difference. And for that enthusiast that wants two watches in one, one side being kind of reserved and the other side leaps and bounds in design ahead of its contemporaries, this is it. 
The Seiko 5 Sports 55th Anniversary Limited Edition. A faithful tribute, a faithful recreation, excellent callback. The real winner with this piece is the case design and the integrated bracelet. The monochrome colors work extremely well, but it feels like a watch that has a lot of character to its design and that I can really appreciate. The Hermes H08 Mono Pusher Chronograph. After the success of the H08, this feels like the natural progression and it's a really good looking watch. Yes, we could call it a quote unquote fashion watch, but it does offer a lot more than that. As an entirely unique design, unique numeral typeface, great choice of orange spot colors, compact in its appearance with the subdials and the mono pusher, but it is all the more functional. The Tissot Heritage 1938. This is a brand that understands gilt dials better than most, and these pieces are great examples. A pre-war reissue that is now cost chronometer certified with a very simple appearance, and the running criticism is the chronometer text appears way too large on this dial, but that's also open to opinion. The Glasuta Original Senator Chronometer. This piece has been redesigned for 2023 and appears all the more neat for it, drawing inspiration from their classic marine chronometer designs and following through in all of the most important areas. As a design, it feels poised and simple, but it's also quite complex when you look at the dial and how it plays with depth. Also enjoy that contrast of the blue date window and how it matches with the handset and the numerals around the dial. Glasuto is one of those brands that really knows how to play with asymmetry and this piece is a good example of that. The Breguet Type 20, reimagined, redesigned, looking back to older pieces, drawing inspiration from them. One example pulling from military inspiration, the bi-compax arrangement, the other pulling from a civilian variant with a tri-compax dial. It's difficult to know how these watches will be received and if they're going to be modified and evolved into the future, but I do feel like there were some areas that they missed out in places, like the brightly colored loom on the dial was unnecessary. The overall thickness of the watch can be improved, but what it does do and what is fundamentally important is that these are flyback chronographs, now with that vintage design appeal, as well as housing and automatic movement. And I think we can all agree that these models in particular do not need date complications on their dials. The Tissot PRX in 35mm. After the success of the 41mm variant, a smaller size was only natural. Here we see a new range of colors, great wearing watches on the wrist. One of the most interesting in this integrated bracelet category because they are so affordable, but also offer you the Powermatic 80 movement with some great tech specs to match. The Longines Spirit Zulu Time in 39mm. After the success of this watch in 42, bringing it down to 39 was also another natural progression. I'm sure there'll be a lot of appreciation for this piece. And it feels like Longines is directly pursuing Tudor with this approach. And I don't think the battle of the GMTs will ever be won between these two brands. The Timex World Time 1972 reissue. After looking at the Seiko 5 Sports, this feels like a direct competitor with that piece and does many of the same things so well. It's case design, bezel implementation, balance and space shared across the dial. Great use of monochromatic tones that work in this watch's favor. It feels like a very faithful and fitting tribute from Timex. Great looking piece. The Zenith Chronomaster Original Black Dial Tricolor. Now I said I wasn't going to look at different dial colored models because we would be here all day, but this one was a surprise and it does look fantastic. Especially because Zenith has never used this configuration with a tricolor dial before. It's crazy to think, but there we go. Exuberant, restrained, exciting. It's an El Primero based on an original design. You can't really get anything wrong. Now, Omega hasn't been brought up once throughout this video, which is very disappointing. For me, as a diehard enthusiast, they haven't had many significant releases this year, but the Summer Blue collection and the Ploprof, this piece is worth talking about. As a part of a massive range of pieces, Aquaterras, Planet Oceans, you name it, the Ploprof was given to us with a facelift. Even at this stage, it's a piece that virtually nobody has been able to get hands on time with, because it's a piece that everyone seems to want. And who can blame them? The colors are striking, it's a great looking size, and hopefully next year and beyond we get to see this watch in a few more colors, preferably back on a mesh bracelet. And what's even more exciting is if they go down the route of creating a reissue of this piece with all of those original colors, oranges, navies, calling back to Comex and its storied past. The Louis Vuitton Tambour, another piece that's looking at the integrated craze, and throwing its hat into the ring. There is more of a subtle and less in your face approach with this watch and how it's been done. The dial is reminiscent of the 1950s with how it's arranged and a small sub dial at the base. But what's most notable is seeing that this is a lugless design. For that reason, it's going to accommodate many different wrist sizes and look great for it. Also very svelte in appearance, 
sleek in profile. As opposed to the typical hard edges that we see with these integrated pieces, it's refreshing to see one that's more inviting with a surface that you want to interact with that's more tactile. The Seiko 1965 Diver Recreation 62 MAS. A near one-to-one -one faithful recreation of Seiko's first dive watch. Another tribute piece, another recreation, but one that has been very well put together. And it's a watch I now own, so full review video will be in the corner of the screen. I can't speak highly enough about the watch's case, its finishing, and attention to detail on the dial. The Longines Hydro Conquest GMT, following after the 39mm Zulu time, this is another great new addition to the collection. It's a piece that I believe is almost spot on perfect, that I think that Longines just missed a few marks. Once again, its size, its case thickness, wearability is excellent, but I think the dial needed a little bit more attention. That said, it's a great looking modern improvement that is a departure from the traditional Hydro Conquest design. Whether or not this is going to be the Hydro Conquest template into the future is anyone's guess. The Alpina Heritage Carry, or Carré, 140 year mechanical. This piece celebrating this anniversary with new old stock movements fitted inside them. And it's the rectangular case design. It's the stepping. It's the numerals on the dial. It's the small seconds. They are beautiful looking pieces. Eerily reminiscent of 1931 JLC dials, but these ones obviously came before them. The Swatch Times Blancpain 50 Fathom Scuba. What else needs to be said about this collection? Whether or not it lives up to the Moon Swatch hype, if this piece is going to be around for very long, if people are even remotely interested in this range. It feels like a bioceramic continuation piggybacking off the success of the Moon Swatch. And the resulting watches you're getting, good designs, great colors, but these watches are essentially throwaway. There is no knowing whether these watches will last or whether or not we will be getting a Breguet Time Swatch collaboration next year. Who knows? The Tudor Pelagos FXD saw a wide range of new releases this year, but one of the biggest standouts was also one of the simplest, the black variation. Black dial, red line of text, collaboration with the US Navy, a great strap pairing. This is another example of a watch that's just changed its colorway, but it has done it very well. And I think the FXD is now on everybody's radar. There's a lot more attention on this collection compared to a few years back, and I think all the better for it. The Porsche Design Chronograph 1 Utility, another reissue, another revival from the brand, but a beautiful watch at that. Porsche Design are delivering some excellent new watches, and these really are the cherries on top of the cake. One of the icons that epitomizes the brand, the 1970s, the 1980s. And with it comes experimental materials like titanium carbide DLC coating. Of course, we know early PVD coating of these models didn't exactly work out. Most of it wore off. Here they are improving the efficiency of its design with materials, as well as giving us a faithful tribute. Maybe it's just me, but Breitling is another brand that hasn't given us many significant or noteworthy watches this year. But in the later half of the year, they've given us a fresh new update of the Avenger. Very much like the Navi Timer and the Super Ocean, these feel like far more streamlined approaches of the original counterparts. Their designs have been taken back to the basics, which could be seen as a good thing or a bad thing. But I think a lot of the time the success is in the simplicity of its design, and these pieces are good examples of that. The Seiko Prospects Marine Master. Now this watch has always had quite a lot of character in the Seiko collecting community. This piece could rub people the wrong way because it doesn't feel much like the High Beat or any other variants, but more akin to the 62 MAS. Whether you love it or hate it, it feels like a beefed up version of the previous SPB variants. But of course, like the 62 MAS reissue, these are now labeled under the SJE range. The Longines Legend Diver in 39mm really grabbed my attention this year. Not because it's unique or original, but because it epitomizes refinement. The choice of going with a beads of rice bracelet with a slim case profile, excellent proportions and balance on its dial, newly implemented crowns with a more vintage inspired knurling. This watch has tons of potential, and I'm sure we're going to see quite a rapid expansion of this range in years to come. And last but not least, I've missed out on a lot of pieces, I'm sure. Apologies for that. But the MBNF HM11 Architects just carries on with the wildness that is Max Busser's design. Experimental, symmetrical, vivid, exciting. Looks like a 1950s spaceship from Roswell. But a cool piece nonetheless to cap off the year. Now at the time I'm finishing this recording, it's taken me over an hour and 40 minutes to catalogue all of these models. I've probably missed at least 20 or 30 notable ones like the Seiko Speed Timer, another great piece, many others in between, but what can you do? It's been a strange year for releases, not too many that stand head and shoulders above the others. And I'd say the ones that have made the most significant impacts 
have not been the most expensive. But nevertheless, I now want to know from you what your favorite watch release of the year was and why. But until then, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch this extortionately long video, I'm sure, um, and the many videos on the channel over the course of this year. I'm sure this is going to be one of the longest of the year. I'll see you in the next one.